So, hi students. This is the uh, last week still of um, our term, and we're still working on problems at 10. I think you can see the proof here. And that was the last one we did involving axioms. This one involves axiom four. Um, and there are more proofs to do, but I think just to break it up a bit, I want to do the remaining translations. Okay, so we're almost done with translations. Um, but if you notice on problem set 10, there are some translation questions that are a little different from ones you've previously done. Uh, for example, there are some involving the word the. Okay, so, you know, question one here and uh, question four, question five, um, that contain the word the. Um, and also, um, there are some involving numbers, like at least two here, and uh, only there refers to, um, you know, that's one dodec, uh, and that's it. There's no more than one dodec. So I'm gonna talk about uh, these kinds of uh, sentences here today. So the word the, um, by the way, all these sentences are supposed to be true in the world on the left there. Um, so it does say the cube is large. I don't know if it seems to be true that the cube is large in this world. I hope so. Um, the point is that there is only one cube. Uh, I think if there are more than one cube, you couldn't really use the expression the cube meaningfully. Um, for example, in, in this world, there's uh, looks like four tets. So if I said the tet is large, uh, now there is a large tet here, but I think um, we wouldn't really accept that as a true statement. The tet is large because, well, um, there's more than one tet. Usually when you say the, um, the word the implies that there is only one. Okay. Think about another case. Uh, let's say um, I'm returning the midterm to you, okay, and I say, well, the student who passed, dot, 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 you'd be thinking, oh, gosh, only one student passed, right? The student who passed. Um, whereas if I said one of the students who passed, that would be a whole different thing. Anyway, so the implies that there's only one. Um, so now, if you want to say the cube is large, we can because there is only one cube and it's large. We have to say that there is only one cube, first of all. Um, so let's look at that. There is some x such that x is a cube. Okay, so that doesn't say that there's only one cube, it says that there is at least one cube, remember. So now I need to add that there is no other cube. There's no cube other than x. So there's various ways to do that. You might think, well, we could do a negative existential. There's no y such that y is a cube and y is different from x. I mean, yeah, we could do that. There's no y such that y is a cube and y is different from, shoot, I don't have that. Um, how do we do that? to get my different from here. Uh, there, okay. There's no y such that y is a cube and y is different from x. So we could do it that way. So far we haven't said anything about it being large. Um, one of those. And X is large, okay? So that's one way to do it. Certainly there is a cube, there's no other cube, and that cube is large. Um, usually though, this middle part where we say that X is the only cube, um, it's more common to do it like this. Um, we do for all Y, if Y is a cube, then uh, y is equal to x, or x equals y, doesn't make any difference. Um, one advantage of that is you don't need the not equal to sign. It's 
It's a bit harder to get with the equal sign if you're typing. Um, otherwise, it's just maybe slightly neater. There's, um, there's no negations in it instead of two negations in the other one. Anyway, this is kind of the standard way to say that the cube is large. And, um, you know, if it didn't say the cube is large, if it said, you know, the dodec is small or something, which is, I guess, also true here, um, it's pretty easy to see how you would change it. You would change cube into dodec and, and large into small. So this is not just one example here. This is a pattern, a template that you can use to translate basically any sentence of the form the f, some property f, is g, some property g. Okay. Um, all right, now numbers. By the way, um, if you um, want to learn a bit more about this, there is a handout. I think I've got it somewhere. Um, yeah, it's on the uh, it's on the iWeb. If I can find that. Yeah, here. Um, handouts. There's a handout called uh, useful. No, that's not it. Uh, complex quantifiers, number 11. Yeah, this one. So this one has everything that I'm talking about with translations. It has a bit more, um, like this has more complicated cases than we need. But anyway, if you want to look at this, you'll get uh, the full story. Okay, let's go back to where we were. Um, here. Right. Okay, so that's the first one anyway. There is a cube, it's the only cube, and it's large. There are at least two tets. Okay, well, you could probably figure out this for yourself, but here we go. Um, there's a pair of things for some x and y, uh, which are both tets. Tet x and tet y. Is that enough? Um, well, if I just leave it like that, then technically it's true, even if there's only one tet, because uh, when x and y are both pointing at that one tet, uh, tet x and tet y will both be true and so on. The whole thing will be true. So to make it um, only correct when there's two different tets, not as it were two identical tets, otherwise known as one tet, uh, we do need to have x is not equal to y. Shoot, I have to find that again. Uh, I need to make a shortcut for that. Um, okay. X is not equal to Y. Okay, there's at least two tests. Um, it's a bit harder to say there are exactly two. I don't know if I'll put that onto the, um, uh, onto the exam or not, but uh, let's say if you want to say, uh, there are exactly two, that is um, two and only two. That's, um, how would you do that? Well, you'd start the same way. Okay, so let's just copy this to save time. Start off by saying there's at least two tets. And then you still have to add a bit more. You have to say there's no third one, or those are the only two that there are. And one way to say that is to say for all z, if z is, a, is a, also a tet, then what can we say about z? Well, the idea is that x and y are the only two tets in the world. There's no other tet. So any, if, if Z is also a tet, then it must be identical to one of the two that we've already identified. So if Z is a tet, then either Z equals X or Z equals Y. Um, and one more bracket. Yeah, so to say that there is exactly two tets is a bit more complicated. And, and at first sight, it looks like a real uh, tough one. But if you break it down, you know, there's, there's a pair of tets. They're not the same. Okay, so there's at least two different tets. And 
any third tet, so to speak, is actually not a third one at all. It's identical to one of the two that we've already got. If you break it down like that, it's not too bad, okay? Anyway, the, the, the encouraging news is that the end is in sight. We're just about at the finish line in terms of translations, okay? So it's not like this is going on forever. Um, number three, E is the only dodec, right? The one and only, we might say. Um, makes it sound like uh, some kind of uh, show, you know, uh, <laughs> some kind of circus or something. Anyway, E is the, is the only dodec. Now, there's a question here about the meaning of English, which I don't exactly know the answer to. The question is, does sentence number three tell us that E is a dodec? You might say, well, of course it does. And I won't disagree. Um, but you could interpret it as saying that um, there is no dodec other than E or something like that, um, which wouldn't technically imply that E is a dodec. Um, you might also say that if you want to say that E is a dodec and the only dodec, you have to say those two things separately, E is a dodec and the only one. Now, I don't know. I think for most people, if you hear that E is the only dodec, you would take that to entail the E is a dodec. So that's what I'm going to do, okay? Um, and that's probably what you should do in the exam to be on the safe side. So we won't take off marks for putting this in, okay? So E is a dodec, e is a dodec, dodec and it's the only one. Um, how do you say that E is the only dodec? Well, I guess, you know, you might most naturally do it with a negated existential although I think the universal way is cleaner. Let's start with this, it's perhaps more obvious. Um, if E is the only dodec, it means there's no dodec other than E. So there's no X such that dodec X and X um, is not equal to E. All right. Um, I think that's pretty obvious then that E is the only dodec, right? Because uh, any other X such that dodec X uh, doesn't exist, right? Um, if you find an X which is also a dodec, you must be pointing at E over here. And so um, X is not equal to E will be false. Um, and so there's no um, value of X that makes this true. Okay, so that's, that's fine, you can do that. Generally though, I'm gonna use the universal, it's a bit cleaner, there's no negations, for all x, if x is a dodec, then x is equal to e. You could also read this as all the dodecs are identical to e, which is of course true in this world, every dodec is identical to e, all right. Now, you might be thinking, well, once I say that every dodec is equal to E, I don't need this anymore. Um, doesn't this universal tell us that E is a dodec? Um, no, I think we talked about one of similar to this before. Um, it doesn't tell us that E is a dodec. If, in fact, there's no dodecs at all in the world, if we got rid of this thing here, um, then uh, dodec x would be false for every x, no matter what value of x we had in the world, it, dodec x would be false, and then the conditional would always be true for all x, right? So this would actually be true if there are no, de no dodecs at all. So um, for that reason, we do actually need to say that e is a dodec. Um, now, this last point is perhaps um, unwise for me to say, but um, oh, I can't help it. Um, you could also say E is the only dodec like that, I guess. Um, that is, uh, if you make it into a biconditional, it now does tell you that E is a dodec because um, it tells you everything identical to E is a dodec. And so obviously E is a dodec. Um, so you could do it that way. Um, I don't really recommend using the biconditional like that because it's so easy to mess it up, okay? But um, certainly I'll mark it right if you do do something like that in the exam or problem set 10. 
Okay, um, what next? The largest, the largest tet. Okay, so again, we're using the word the, but notice how this is a little bit different from saying the cube, all right? Um, because um, the point here is that obviously there's more than one tet. And um, I could say the large tet is in the same column as E, but you know, the largest tet is not necessarily large. So I can't just assume that the largest tet means the same as the large tet. You could, for example, have a world in which there's a bunch of small tets and one medium tet, okay? And then the largest tet would be the medium one, all right? So um, largest is, is different from large, for sure. Um, how do we say the largest tet? Well, um, we have to say, first of all, that there is a largest tet, okay? There is something which is um, the largest tet. Now, what do we mean by the largest tet? Well, I guess it's gotta be a tet. So there is a tet. Um, what makes it the largest? Well, it means that it's larger than all the other tets. Okay, so I guess take any y. Um, if y is also a tet, then larger, so this largest, x is supposed to be the largest tet, so x is larger than y. Okay, does that then mean that um, there is a largest tet? Does it mean that? We've got to be careful here because um, y ranges over all the objects, including the largest tet. Okay, so in other words, there will be a point um, in, if we did the satisfaction table, there would be a, a row where X and Y were both pointing at this largest tet. And then we'd be saying that that largest tet is in fact larger than itself, which obviously it can't be. So we don't want to say that X is larger than all the tets. We want to say that it's larger than every other tet. It's larger than every, other, every tet other than itself. So we need to actually have an X is not equal to Y in here somewhere, I guess, um, here. X, uh, not equal to Y. I think that's right now. So there is a tet and take any other tet that isn't X, X is larger than that other tet. So X is larger than all the tets, all the other tets. And we also need to say that X is in the same column as E, which I'm running out of space. Okay, I'm just gonna make this bigger. That seemed to work, okay. Uh, there is a tet, so you can see that. Um, there is a tet, and it's larger than every other tet. And X again, that largest tet, is in the same column as E, which it is. Okay, so these are kind of complicated, I have to admit, but there's only a very small number of different patterns here. So it's not too much to just memorize uh, a few extra patterns, and then you can get these right pretty reliably. Okay, last one. Um, the small tet is in the same row as E. Now this is really the same as the first one, just with a slight complication. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna copy that and bring it down here. Um, okay. Now notice that the, um, they're both of the form, you might say, um, The P is Q, something like that, right? You've got a property that there's only one of in the world, cube in this case, there's only one cube, and it all, that one thing also has the property Q, the thing, the property after the word is, okay? So in doing one of these translations, you've just got to identify the P and the Q, 
So um, the P property here seems to be, uh, let me make it, uh, Put it in a different color like red okay um, and the q property let's say we do it in uh, green okay um, there so in the sentence i've already translated before the p property is cube so i need to turn cube into small tet all right um, which obviously is compound it's going to be a conjunction so small junction tet maybe I'll keep the color coding just to make it easier to see what's going on Okay, so there's small tet. Now, um, notice that cube actually appears twice um, because I not only have to say that there is a cube, but I have to say that it's the only cube. So I'm gonna have to put small tet here as well. Let's copy it. Copy and paste. Um, and the, uh, the, the Q property only appears once at the end, large here. So I have to get rid of large and make it um, same row. Uh, X, E. All right, I'm gonna put that in green. There, um, run out of space again. I can, I can make this smaller, can I? Shrink this down. Okay, the small tet is in the same row as E. For some X, X is a small tet. And, uh, oops, this should be Y here, excuse me. Um, you could tell that because it's cube y on uh, question one. Um, there is one small tet and at least one and every other small tet is equal to x and furthermore x is in the same row as e. All right, so basically that's it. We've got um, the f is g or the p is q. We've got uh, at least two there. Um, we've got only one. Um, um, and uh, we've got superlatives, largest, smallest, um, things like that. Um, yeah. Oh, by the way, I, did, um, I didn't really mention this, but we can say, even though we can't say the tet, because there's four tets, we can say the small tet, because there's only one small tet. These two are medium, and that one is large back there. So um, there are more um, extra translations you can look at on that handout that I mentioned, um, but I think these ones will be enough for uh, problem set 10 and the final exam. I've kind of slimmed it down a little bit compared to um, previous years. Okay, well, let's do a few more proofs as well. Um, I think this one is a little trickier than some that we've looked at because it has um, multiple quantification and they're not the same. We've got a the universal inside an existential, and the conclusion has it the other way around, the existential inside the universal. And um, I've labeled these Bieber and Mother um, because you can see that the premise is kind of a Bieber sentence. It says that there is a girl uh, whom every boy likes. There's some X, such X is a girl, and for all Y, if Y is a boy, then Y, that is the boy, likes X, the girl. There's a girl, so there's a popular girl uh, whom every boy likes. The conclusion then is that every boy has at least one girl um, whom that boy likes. That must be true because everybody at, at least likes the popular girl 
um, I don't know what to call her, G, let's say we'll just call her G. Um, every boy at least likes G, and so must like at least one girl, okay. Now, um, you might also notice that we couldn't turn these um, premise and conclusion around. If we switch them over, tried to prove the premise from the conclusion, it wouldn't be valid, right? It may be that every boy likes a different girl, you know, Fred likes Sally and, you know, Jim likes Rachel and so on. Um, there might not be any single girl that all the boys like. Okay, so uh, it only would work this way around. Let's see if we can prove it now. Um, these. Um, all right, so when we first look at a proof, we're always looking for something that is urgent. Um, and the urgent things are existentials to eliminate and universals to introduce. Is there anything like that here? Well, yes, there's both. Okay, we've got an existential premise, that's the main operator, and we've also got a universal conclusion to introduce. So, no shortage of urgent patients. Now, what do you do if you're an ER doctor and you know two very urgent patients come in simultaneously? You can't deal with them both at the same time. You have to pick one first. Um, which one do you pick? Well, I guess basically you're gonna to have to flip a coin if they're sort of equally urgent. Um, there's no reason to take one before the other. You've just got to pick one randomly. And so that's basically what we have to do here. We have to, without you know worrying too much because whichever way around we do it, it should work fine. We just have to pick which one we're gonna do. Uh, which we do, I don't know, I'm gonna pick the universal first, okay? You can try it the other way around if you want. Try to do the existential first. Um, but I'm gonna do the universal first. And you can also see that the, um, the next main operator after the universal is this conditional. So this is a universal conditional, that is it's of the form, you know, for all x, um, px conditional ux. All right, and if you remember, we have a special rule, special rule of inference, just for proving things of this form. So uh, we may as well use that shortcut here. To, you know, I mean, there's fewer subproofs, and that's always a good thing. All right, so um, to prove a universal, we always have to box a new constant. And here, our constant will be standing for an arbitrary boy. So I propose that we would call this uh, arbitrary boy B, B for boy, just to help us keep it straight. And um, if we're going to use the shortcut, if you remember, we kind of do the universal intro and the conditional intro all in one go. So in addition to boxing B, we have to assume that B has the property P, which in this case is the property of being a boy. So boy B. Okay, so that's what we need. We're not just assuming that B is any object in the world. We're assuming in particular that B is any boy in the world. Okay, let's have some more lines. We're gonna need a few lines here. It's a fairly long proof. Um, the conclusion then we need is basically this, with a slight change. Um, you know, we're doing a conditional intro as well as a, a universal intro, all in the same subproof. And so, assuming B is a boy, we have to prove this. Um, only not about Y, we have to prove it about B. So we'll take Y equal to B there. Um, if we can prove that if B is a boy, then uh, there is a girl whom B likes, it'll follow that every boy has a girl whom he likes, right? Okay, um, this is what we need to fit the pattern, um, which you can look up. Okay, so now we're set up for the universal intro. Maybe I'll even write universal intro here so I don't forget what was going on. Universal intro from line two to something. I don't know where it'll end six right now, but it might be longer. Okay, 
And now we um, have to deal with the other urgent patient. That is, we have to create a subproof so we can eliminate this existential. So that's um, another subproof. Um, and to eliminate an existential or, or to create the subproof for that, we have to think of a name for something we know to exist. This is a girl now that every boy likes. Um, let's call her G, as I did before. Um, of course, G has to be fresh, but it is. Um, and so we have, we're assuming that G has the property that X does here. Um, that is, G is a girl and every boy likes G. Okay, um, I don't want that underlined. Put it in the right spot. Okay, um, so let G be uh, one of the girls, the girl or one of the girls that every boy likes. This is for, um, this is going to come out then in the end by existential limb um, from the existential is line one and the existential limb subproof starts at line three. Okay. Um, now what do we have to have at the end of the subproof in order to be able to pull this out? Well, if you look at the pattern for existential LM, we need to have that exact sentence. No messing around with it, no changes of uh, constants into variables or vice versa. Okay, so that's got to be our last line of the subproof. And so now we're basically set up in a way we've done the hard work. Okay. Um, and all we need to do now is get from line three here to line five. And I think we're going to need at least a couple more lines than that. Um, the line numbers are all wrong now. Okay. Um, I guess, what do we do next? Um, we don't have anything else that's urgent. We have to introduce an existential. We have to eliminate a conjunction. Well, let's start with that. Let's eliminate the conjunction. So uh, we can say that G is a girl, and also uh, I'll just copy this. Um, so I've just broken up my conjunction into its separate conjuncts. That's by and a limb on three. And this, oops, that's also and a limb line three. Now we have a universal to eliminate. I guess we should eliminate that. So um, we'll have, let's take off the universal quantifier, put the woof inside there. Um, but now if you remember the, the second part of universal limb is to replace the variable with a constant. Um, what should we replace y with here? I mean, we've got boy B all over the place in the proof. Well, okay, we've got it here at least. Um, then I guess we should replace Y with B. That would make sense. Um, yeah, so if B is a boy, then B likes G. Okay, that's universal limb on line five. Okay. Um, now we're obviously going to need more lines than that. Put a couple more in here. Seven, eight. Um, now we want to show that there's a girl whom B likes. Um, well, since B is a boy, according to premise two, or assumption at line two, and if B is a boy, then B likes G. Why don't we infer that B likes G? Seems to be helpful. And that follows by conditional limb 
from line two and six. Uh, right. So we've now kind of proven that there is a girl whom B likes because we know that G is a girl from line four and B likes G. So let's put those together. He's a girl and likes B, G. Okay. That's and intro from uh, four and seven. Okay. Now I don't think we need any more lines. We just need to finish this off. Why is that? Um, straighten this up now. Let's talk amongst ourselves for a minute. There. Um, why is that? Well, I think we can now say that there is a girl whom B likes because we know that G has exactly that property of being a girl whom B likes. Nine follows from eight by existential intro. Take out, turn uh, G into X and then, then put a sum X on the front. Um, and now, we've reached the goal that we wanted inside the existential LM subgroup. We can pull out that last line by existential LM and that is three to nine. And the universal intro subproof turns out to be two to 10. Yeah, so um, not terribly tricky in a way, but you do have to be careful about all these substitutions between names and variables. Um, Obviously, you've got to make sure that that B is confined within the the outer subproof here, which it is, and that G is confined to the inner subproof, which again it is. Uh, you have to keep these promises that you make when you box at constants. Okay, um, maybe we'll do one more and then um, take a break and uh, leave the rest of the proofs for one last video. Um, Let's look at this one, which is a little different because it's got a biconditional, uh, universal biconditional in the conclusion. Um, but the main operator there is, of course, the universal. Um, the premises um, are all universal. So between eliminating universals and introducing universals, is anything here urgent? Um, well, we know the answer. The uh, introducing a universal is urgent, but um, eliminating universals is not. By the way, you might be wondering, what the heck are these predicates? Brillig and Mimsy and Slithy? This is, uh, I think, a poem that I mentioned called uh, Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll that has all these made up words in it. Anyway, that, that's where these words are from. Um, all right, so this is a universal. Now, it's not a universal conditional because it's a bi-condition. Okay, um, sorry, I had to deal with something there. I um, was saying that this is a universal that's urgent, but we don't have a shortcut for it because it's not a universal conditional, it's a universal biconditional, and there isn't a shortcut for that. So, um, yeah, we just have to do it the old-fashioned way, which uh, involves, if you remember, let's create some more lines here. Six. Uh, involves just boxing a constant. Now, do we have any constants? We have B, so we can't use B. Let's use A. Um, a, and you know, you might want to put something about Brillig or Minzy there, but you can't. Um, there's no available shortcut here. Okay. And so the goal then in this subproof is to prove the biconditional here, um, except with the constant replaced by our 
sorry, with the variable z replaced by our boxed constant, which is a. Okay, so let a be any object in the world. We need to prove that a is brillig, if and only if it's mimsy, uh, whatever that means. Okay. Yeah, now we're set up for the universal intro. I'll write universal intro. Oops. Universal intro there now. Oops. Going into simple font here. Um, get that to the right one. Okay, this is going to be universal intro on uh, four to something. Okay. Well, I guess. There's nothing urgent to do. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, there is. I guess now within the within this subproof, four to eight right now, but it'll get bigger. We have to do the biconditional intro. So we're going to have to assume first of all that A is Brillig, and get down somehow to the claim that A is Mimsy. Then we're going to have to turn around and go backwards. So we'll need at least a few more lines. I'm going to space this out again. So from Brillig to Mimsy and then back, we're going to have to go Mimsy again, um, back to Brillig, hoping that this sort of is reasonably clear what's going on with my typed, uh, typed proof system. It's not great. We can't really see definitely that there's a, a break in the uh, Fitch bar between seven and eight because there's breaks in every line. But yeah, it's just what it is, I guess. Um, you can kind of tell that there must be a break because I'm going into a new assumption at line eight, which you couldn't do unless the previous assumption had ended. Yeah, I guess that's just what it is. But anyway, we're going from Brillig to Mimsy, five to seven, and then from Mimsy to Brillig, eight to 10, and that allows us to um, pull out the biconditional then um, at line, whatever that'll be. I'll find out later. Okay, so I guess we're going to do a lot of conditional or rather um, universal limb now. Let's maybe start with line one because it does have, if something is brillic, then it has these other properties. That looks useful. Let's do universal limb here. Oh, and brillic here. That's an assumption too. Um, Okay, that looks better. All right, so we need to um, remove the universal quantifier as part of the universal LM, and we need to choose a suitable constant to replace a, a x with, and a is the obvious choice so that we'll have a match Brillig a here, and if Brillig a, then something there. So that's all. A is now. Okay, that is going to be universal LM on line one. Okay, um, and it looks like I'm also pretty close to proving that A is a Mimsy because we've got Mimsy in the consequent of this conditional. A is a Brillig. If A is a Brillig, then it's both Mimsy and Slithy. So we can get A is both Mimsy and Slithy by conditional LM. That is uh, conditional LM on five and six. Okay, and since it's both Mimsy and Slithy, it's obviously um, Mimsy by Andalim. Andalim from line uh, seven. I just thought of something. Um, I don't know if we need to do this, but one thing we could do to 
make it so that there's uh, a bit more obvious break there. Add a little space there. I don't know. Yeah, I kind of like that. It's optional. All right, now we need to get back from Mimsy to Brillic. Um, which one of these are we going to need? It looks like we might need both of these actually, just from a quick glance. And I think we're going to need more lines too. Probably that many. We'll see. Okay. Um, Got to get from Mimsy back to Brillig. So we're going to have to eliminate both two and three, both uh, using A, I think, for the um, constant that we introduce. Um, that's universal limb on line two. Two, and we're going to have to replace Y with A. If A is either Slithy or Mimsy, then A is Tove. And now three. East. Um, get rid of the underline. This is universal LM. And three. Again, using A, there's no limit to the number of times you can do a universal limb with the same constant. Uh, if it's true for everything, it's certainly true for A. Okay, so if A is Tove, then A outgrade B and A is Brillig. So uh, this looks pretty straightforward now. Given that A is Mimsy, I can say that it is either Slithy or Mimsy. Should put them in that order too, so that it exactly matches the antecedent of the conditional we want to eliminate. That is or intro. You remember or intro? If it's Mimsy, then it's got to be either slide or Mimsy. Uh, it's one of those. It's got to be true. Or intro from nine. And now uh, we have the antecedent of the conditional at line 10, we can say that um, A is a Tove, that is conditional LM on 11 and 12, no, excuse me, 10 and 12. Right, 10, if it's slightly or Mimsy, then it's a Tove, it is slightly or Mimsy, therefore it's a tough. Okay, that's right. And it looks like we need more lines. Um, I think that's going to be enough. Well, it's a long proof. Anything with a biconditional in it tends to be long. Biconditional in the conclusion, I mean. Okay, so A is a Tove. Um, so now we can eliminate line 11. And if it's a Tove, then it's outgrade B and also Brillig. There we are. And that's also conditional LM from 11 and 13. Like that. So these are both true. Oh, I've got too many lines. I don't need that 15 there. Get rid of that. Yeah, now, uh, this is now 15. I can get Brillig A simply by and LM. And a limb from 14. Okay, then um, we're done. 16 and 17, long one. So now we went from Brillig to Mimsy and then back from Mimsy to Brillig. So we can say uh, this is true by conditional intro um, from uh, five to eight. 
And the second subproof was 9 to 15. And then finally, the universal intro goes all the way from 4 to 16. Wow. OK. That was long. I don't think I'd give you something that long in the final. Let's hope not, eh? Um, just typing that thing in takes a while. OK, I think I'll end this video here. We still have some De Morgan to come, um, including the hard one, and then proofs with identity. Um, and then there's even a few more after that. OK. All right. I'll break up. Uh, stop recording.